The book of Daniel is one of the most well-known books of the Bible. Daniel is one of those Bible characters where most people have at least heard about him. Because while his situation and his circumstances could be described as colorful and dangerous and sometimes flat out evil, Daniel was always consistent. He was always faithful. He had conviction in a world of compromise. Many sermons have been preached about his example. Many books have been written about his life and his prophecies. Probably the most famous chapter in the entire book is chapter 6, which describes Daniel and the lion's den. Honestly, if you spend any time in a Bible-believing and teaching church, you've heard about Daniel and the lion's den. Uh, but when it comes to this book of the Bible, probably the most second well-known chapter is the one we're entering into this evening. Daniel chapter 3, where his three friends are told to bow down before a huge golden statue. They do not, and they are thrown into a fiery furnace. In Psalm 34 verse 19, David wrote, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. That's probably not what you wanted to hear when you came to church this nice, uh, tonight, but it is true nonetheless. Thankfully, though, David doesn't end there. God inspired him to continue and write, But the Lord delivereth him, the righteous, out of them all. The question could still be asked, though, why? Why is it that the righteous suffer? And my purpose in tonight's message is not to uh, spend the entire time answering that question because you could easily devote an entire message to that topic. You could do a whole series on the topic of suffering and pastor has. If you're interested in that, you can always go to Sermon Audio or YouTube or some of the other podcast platforms we're on and look up that series on suffering. As born again believers, though, we do go through hard times. We do face affliction. We do suffer. And those are topics that are easy enough to talk about, but when you're the one who's going through that difficulty, it's not so easy. Sometimes you ask questions. When that's us, we need to remember that the sufferings of this life are temporary. That's not how it's always going to be. They're not permanent. God can work in our lives through the suffering. He can mold us. He can refine us. Just as gold is refined in the fire as Peter describes it. In all of it, God can be glorified. Jesus can be magnified even in the midst of suffering. And so we need to realize that God's grace will help us through it, whatever we're facing. I tell you that because tonight we're going to see an excellent example of this truth played out. As this chapter tells us of three men who were thrown into a fiery furnace. And why did that happen to them? It's because they were doing what was right. They stood for what God wanted them to stand for. Again, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. And we'll see this vividly illustrated in Daniel chapter 3. Does that mean that every time we face hardships or suffering, God will deliver us the same exact way that these three men were delivered? No. And unfortunately, don't you wish that was the case? Uh, but what it does tell us is that God is with us in the midst of our suffering, just as he was with them in the midst of the fiery furnace. Our God is a very present help and he can and will deliver. You might remember from our last few messages in this series that uh, we saw Daniel and his three friends had almost been put to death. The king had a dream and Nebuchadnezzar called four different groups of wise men to not only interpret the dream, but also to tell him what the dream was. Those wise men could not do it, and Nebuchadnezzar realized that they were phonies, they were liars, and he ordered all of them to be put to death, including Daniel and his three friends. However, God revealed the dream to Daniel along with the interpretation, and Nebuchadnezzar praised God at the end of Daniel chapter 2. The king rewarded Daniel, and the text tells us that Nebuchadnezzar made Daniel a great man. He gave Daniel great gifts. And he also gave him a promotion. He made him ruler over the province of Babylon. That's quite the promotion for a guy who was in his early 20s. But Daniel didn't allow it to go to his head. And he actually remembered his friends. And, and they were given promotions as well. So they all came out of this very dangerous situation unscathed. God protected them. God blessed them. And because they stood for what was right, they never had to face any other difficulties for as long as they lived. Is that what God's word tells us? No, it is not. 
as the very next verses in this book tell us of another dangerous situation that they had to go through. And you know what? In that moment, these three men probably hated the persecution that they were facing. And who could blame them? No sane person would willingly sign up to be thrown into a fiery furnace where it was intended that they should be burned alive. So that's probably how they felt in the moment. But if you could talk to them right now, and one day we'll get that opportunity, but if you could talk to them right now, could you imagine what they would tell you? I'm sure what they would say would probably line up with Romans 8.18 where it says that I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Now, while the book of Daniel goes from one very dangerous situation to an even more dangerous situation, there's actually roughly 20 years that take place in the chronological order of events. So we see that these men here are now roughly 40 years old, and Nebuchadnezzar was probably close to his 50s. But according to our study, it would seem that these men went from one bad set of circumstances to an even tougher set of circumstances, a more dangerous situation. There's a phrase that we have to describe such a set of circumstances. We say that a person would go out of the frying pan into the fire. Well, tonight we're going to see these men go out of the frying pan into the furnace. However, in all of it, these three men were faithful. They stood for what was right, and because of that, God was faithful, just as God always is. And I hope that that can cause our faith to grow. As we go through this study, my prayer is that we can see the examples of these men and take courage from it. It will cause us to be more courageous with our faith and and sharing the gospel. That as the world becomes darker, our light will shine brighter, the light of Jesus Christ that we share with others. And that we might be ready to always give an answer to every man that asketh us a reason of the hope that's in us with meekness and with fear. Because ultimately, Jesus Christ is that light. He is the way, the truth, the light. And no man can come to the Father but by him. So may we be courageous with that good news that God has entrusted to us. Just as we see these three men being courageous and taking a stand for what was right in their time. But let's pick up our study in the very first verse of Daniel chapter 3. And with that, it also brings us to our first point this evening, which is the creation of the image. Point number one, the creation of the image. Daniel 3 verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three square cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king said to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the province to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. There's a lot to unpack in these first couple of verses. First of all, if a person though was to read from the end of chapter 2, And go straight into chapter 3. As Pastor mentioned this morning, there were no chapter divisions. So can you imagine reading this and then wondering what happened? What happened? Why did King Nebuchadnezzar go from praising God and then three verses later he's creating a statue, a huge statue to himself? What took place? How did he get to that point? And of course the answer is that roughly 20 years had transpired between what we consider chapter 2 and chapter 3. In the grand scheme of things, 20 years really isn't that long of time. However, in an individual's life, that can be a longer longer time period. Think back to 20 years from where you're at right now. Where were you 20 years ago? For me, I think I was in eighth grade, in middle school. That feels like ages ago. So 20 years can be a long time. And for Nebuchadnezzar, it was long enough for him to forget what he had said at the end of chapter 2. And there had been a lot that had taken place in that time period. Um, Nebuchadnezzar had conquered Jerusalem a second time. He had hauled away a lot of the people as captives. He had plundered the temple. And later on, he would actually destroy the temple in Jerusalem. And he destroyed a lot of Jerusalem in in the process. And so he turned the Holy Land into a wasteland. So at this point, Nebuchadnezzar was probably feeling pretty good about himself. No one could stand up against his might. Or so he thought. 
Later on in this message, we'll see that Nebuchadnezzar even goes so far to say that he's more powerful than God. What God can go against him is the question that he asks. And so may this serve as an example to us. Don't allow yourself to drift from God and from the things of God. If you're a born-again believer, you've put your faith in Jesus Christ alone to save you, you are eternally secure. You have a home awaiting you in heaven. Now, after you're saved, if you've made that decision to follow Jesus Christ with your life, not to be saved or to stay saved, but because you want to bring God glory, don't waver in that. Don't conform to this world. Instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you can then prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So again, don't allow yourself to drift from the things of God. Unfortunately, that's exactly what we see happen in Nebuchadnezzar to the point that he now has created this massive statue of gold. We don't know this for sure, but maybe part of the idea for this statue came from Daniel chapter 2, where Nebuchadnezzar had that dream and the head of the image was made out of gold. The head of that image, as we found, described him. It represented him. Now, in the dream, in chapter 2, it had been, been predicted that an inferior kingdom would come and one day defeat Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire. However, here in chapter 3, that has not yet happened. 20 years have now gone, come and gone, and he's still standing. So maybe he decided to make the entire statue out of gold just to show how powerful he was. Again, that, that's a possibility that he did that in his pride. By this point as well, Babylon had defeated Egypt. So Nebuchadnezzar would have known about the pharaohs of old who had created giant statues of themselves out of stone and brick, hoping that their fame and glory would continue on for generations. Uh, who knows, maybe Nebuchadnezzar himself saw some of those statues as he went around conquering before he officially was king. So that's also a possibility where the idea originated. But unlike the pharaohs of old, Nebuchadnezzar didn't want to make his statue out of brick or out of stone. He decided he'd make the whole thing out of gold. And we're told that this was quite the undertaking because this statue was three score cubits tall. Three score cubits tall. What does that mean though? Well, a score is 20. So three score would be three times 20, which is 60. 60 cubits tall by six cubits wide. Now just by itself, those dimensions are quite interesting because six is the number of a man. What day was man created? Day six. How many days did, did God tell man to rest? Or how many days did God tell man to work? Six days, the seventh day he was to rest. What's the number of the beast in the book of Revelations, the number of the Antichrist? Six, six, six. So uh, again, a very fitting number for a statue built out of the pride of mankind. 60 cubits by six cubics. What does that all mean though? A cubit isn't a measurement that we use today. Um, honestly, I wish that we used the metric system. That's probably blasphemous to some of you here today. If it is, forgive me. But uh, to me, it just makes sense. Units of 10, and it's just logical in my mind. I don't know about you. Unfortunately, though, here in the States, we use the imperial system. And what that means is that one cubit was roughly 18 inches long. So when you do the math, this statue was 90 feet tall. 90 feet tall. I'd ask Pastor Trout how tall the peak of our auditorium was. He said the peak of our ceiling is 27 feet tall. So this statue was over three times the height of the peak of our auditorium. That's incredible. And then, of course, it, it was also nine feet across. And with that, uh, you know, it seems a lot of Bible teachers and scholars agree the statue was not made out of solid gold. Rather, based on its proportions, it would seem that it was a wooden statue plated in gold. Either way, this was a massive statue. Whenever Nebuchadnezzar built something, it was colossal in size. It was truly magnificent. We've seen that in past messages with the Haining Gardens in Babylon. The walls of Babylon were huge. Uh, the palace, the, the temples that he built were very intricate in their architecture. So this statue was not going to be an exception. From a human perspective, the construction of this statue had to be incredible. 
but it wasn't just the creation of it that was magnificent. He was also planning quite the dedication. Point number two tonight, the dedication of the image. The dedication of the image. We're not only told about the size and the make of the statue, we're also told where Nebuchadnezzar had it placed. You see in verse 1, it says that he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. To us here in central Minnesota, those are just names on a page. They probably have no real meaning to us, but they are significant and we shouldn't read past them. Again, we're told he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. That is not inner city Babylon. There were at least two reasons why Nebuchadnezzar would have done this. First of all, even though this was a huge statue, there were a lot of buildings and walls within the city limits of Babylon that were massive. And so this would have just kind of blended in with everything else around that. Nebuchadnezzar didn't want that to happen. He wanted this statue, his statue, to stand out. He wanted it to be something special, and so he set it up in a plain. The region in this part of the world was already pretty flat and level, but a plain. I mean, this, can you imagine when the sun was out and shining? Shining on the gold, the shimmer, the gleam. You could see the statue from miles around. This really stood out. And then secondly, we're told in verse 2 that Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces. Why? To come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. That's a lot of people. If you were counting there, you would realize that's eight different groups. And each group represented a whole lot of people. And so because of that, he needed a lot of space, a lot of real estate for them all to gather. As we know from the first chapter of Daniel, there was a good number of people listed who were not originally from Babylon. They came from different nations with their own cultures, their own religions, their own speech. And so I'm sure Nebuchadnezzar wanted to unite them. In his pride, he joined them all together in what he wanted to be a state religion. A state religion. You know, it's interesting. Vladimir Lenin tried a very similar tactic roughly 100 years ago. He, of course, was the Soviet dictator. Lenin had huge statues of himself uh, built and then set up within all the countries that comprised the former Soviet Union. And he did that to show people who was in charge. Now, of course, we know God ultimately is in charge. But in Lenin's mind, that's why he did it. Nebuchadnezzar, though, did this hundreds of years before Lenin ever tried it. By building a massive statue, Nebuchadnezzar could unite the people under one religion, the worship of him, the state, the country. By placing the statue in the plain of Dura, it not only caused the statue to tower over everything else that was there, it gave them enough space for everyone to come and gather at one time. Can you imagine what this must have looked like? This was quite the celebration for him. At this point, Nebuchadnezzar was completely filled with pride. And that can happen to any per person in any set of circumstances. But that is especially true when an individual has unbridled power. As has been said, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Honestly, this statue was really a monument to Nebuchadnezzar's pride. Why do I say that? Well, let's keep reading our main text here. Verse 3 then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then an herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages. As we've already seen, these people came from a lot of different backgrounds, and that's emphasized here. People, nations, languages. That at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music. Those were all kinds of different instruments that were going to play together. So this was a huge event. This was very elaborate. Um, you know, the, humanly speaking, this was probably one of the best days in Babylon's history. That's the way Nebuchadnezzar was planning it every way. Uh, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. 
Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. So when the music played, everyone, no exception, everyone was supposed to bow down and worship this statue. Which brings us to our third point tonight, the worship of the image. The worship of the image. But there's a big problem with this. True worship isn't an outward show. Rather, it's a matter of the heart. You can't force someone to worship. Uh, certainly when we worship from our innermost being, that can be shown externally. It can happen. Uh, honestly, though, there's a lot of people today who have a similar mentality about music that the Babylonians had. That when a certain type of music is played, you're worshiping. That's not really how God sees it, though. Uh, we can worship God through music, but it doesn't automatically happen. It's a personal choice that an individual has to make. You can't force it on people. And you know what? That's just as true for all of us. Uh, you know, in this situation here, Nebuchadnezzar was trying to force people to worship out of fear. Uh, again, you can't force someone to worship, though. Just as us today, you can't force someone to come to church and it then becomes worship. It has to be a matter of an individual's choice. Now, it is a very good thing to come to church and make no mistake about it. God commands us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. So don't skip church. Don't miss the gathering together. Instead, we're to do it the more as we see the day approaching. And there's a whole list of reasons that God wants us to come to church. But showing up to church does not automatically equal worship. It has to be a decision that is made. It has to come from the heart. As Samuel said in 1 Samuel 15, 22, Had the Lord his great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. So true worship has to be done the right way. It has to be done in obedience to God, first and foremost. You'll hear people say that they want to worship God the way that they want to do it. And there's a lot of ways you can worship God, but it has to be done the way God says. It has to be done from the heart and with the right motivation behind it, in obedience to him. So again, true worship cannot be forced. But in our main text here, we find Nebuchadnezzar trying to force everyone everyone in Babylon to worship this image that he has set up. Again, to create this state religion. And if all of the pomp and circumstance, the music, the gold, the magnificence of it wasn't enough to convince everyone that they should bow down, Nebuchadnezzar had a backup plan. He gave a threat, and it was not an idle threat. He said, if a person does not bow down, they will be burned alive in a fiery furnace. Somewhere nearby, this, this statue, he must have created this furnace. He assumed that people would love their own lives more than love what they believed and what they stood for. And you know what? For the most part, he was right. He was right, unfortunately. Let me ask you tonight, how much would you be willing to give up for the sake of the gospel? Are you willing to stand up for what is right, even when may, it may cost you or it may cost me? Or would you deny Jesus Christ in that moment? Now, let me be very clear. If you placed your faith in Jesus Christ alone to save you, you can never lose your salvation. You've already possessed everlasting life. You are kept by the power of God. Um, God is holding on to you just as Jesus says in John 10, verse 28. So even if you turned apostate and you said verbally that you reject Jesus Christ, you do not lose your spot in heaven. God has already promised you a place in heaven. I, why do I say that though? Well, I want you to see this for yourself. Hold your spot in Daniel chapter 3 and turn now to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. In this passage we're about to read, it's important to note that Paul was writing to a saved person. He was writing to a young pastor named Timothy. And under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, Paul writes in 2 Timothy 2 verse 13, if we believe not. So again, Paul's writing to a saved person. What happens if we stop believing? If we believe not? If we turn apostate? Well, if we believe not, yet he, God, abideth faithful. God cannot deny himself. 
God has already promised us everlasting life. The moment we believe, we have it, we possess it. He's promised us a reservation in heaven. So God cannot deny those promises he's already made. He is faithful. God's word is settled in heaven. That's how sure these promises are. As a believer, even if you chose to deny Jesus Christ, you'd still be saved. But, but if you deny Jesus Christ, you could lose out on a place of honor. You could also lose out on potential rewards once you get to heaven. Look one verse earlier in 2 Timothy 2.12. It says, if we suffer, so we don't deny Jesus Christ. Instead, we take a stand for what's right. We suffer for him. We shall also reign with him. We'll have that place of honor with Jesus Christ. And the verse continues, if we deny him, if we deny him, he also will deny us. Deny us what? Well, it's not talking about heaven because we see that in the very next verse. We, we are eternally secure. He would deny us rewards once we're in heaven. And we see that other places in scripture. So knowing all of that, though, let me ask you again, if push comes to shove, how willing are you to stand for what's right? How willing are you to stand when your family makes fun of the gospel or makes fun of the word of God? What about with your coworkers at your job? There's a lot of situations in life. How serious is this to us? Are we willing to face persecution? Not be obnoxious with our faith, but do what's right. Do what God wants us to do. Go back to Daniel chapter 3. As we see in our, our main text here, three men who were willing to stand for what was right. Daniel 3, we'll pick up in verse 8. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. Now, that's nothing new here. Down through history, the Jews have been accused. However, what's unique in this situation, unlike many Jews today who are not believers in Jesus Christ, these three Jews had trusted in Jesus Christ and the Messiah who would come and pay for the sins of the whole world. So here's all the people. Everyone's falling down. They've all got their faces in the dirt. But these three don't bow down. They would have stuck out like a sore thumb. And by the way, these three guys were higher up in government. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or as their Hebrew names are put, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now some people might wonder, where was Daniel? Why isn't he listed here? The text doesn't tell us. Maybe he was on official government business. He had an assignment to do. Or maybe he was sick. Or maybe there was some other reason. We, we simply don't know. I think it's safe to say, though, that Daniel would not have bowed down. We know that from Daniel chapter 1 and also from Daniel chapter 6. He took a stand even in the face of great adversity. At this point, though, some of the nobles in government, the higher caste as they were thought of, the Chaldeans, approached the king. And they bring three charges against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. As we shall see, the first charge was completely false, but the other two charges were true. They, verse 9, uh, these Chaldeans, spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he shall be cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. For the last 20 years, it seems that things had gone fairly well for these three men. They had been given a promotion at the end of Daniel chapter 2, and they held that position. Nothing bad seems to have happened to them in that time. And when you go all the way back to when they were in school in Daniel chapter 1, they were men of integrity. They did what was right. They faced adversity, and, and they didn't waver. And God blessed them. They left the results up to him. God, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, found them 10 times better than anyone else who was in their kingdom. So they did what was right then. And then in their jobs, they did their best. They were good co-workers. We saw that with Daniel. Even in the midst of a very dangerous set of circumstances, Daniel pleaded for the lives of the rest of the wise men. He said, don't kill them. Let's wait. Let me talk to God and, and see what we can do after that. And so what an example these men have set up for us. If you are a younger person at this time and you're in school, follow the example of Daniel and his friends. Do what's right. 
If you are an employee at this time or an employer, uh, follow the example of Daniel and his friends. Be the best employee, the best co-worker that you can possibly be. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord. So be a person of integrity. Don't waver in that conviction. However, when it comes to doing something that's wrong, when it goes against the word of God or against God himself, that's where we draw the line. That's where we take a stand and say, no, I can't do this. It goes against what God has told me to do. Don't give in. Don't compromise. It doesn't matter what other coworkers are doing. Or again, if you're in school, it doesn't matter what your other classmates are doing. You be the one who's determined to do what's right. Everyone else in this, this passage here had bowed down to this statue. We don't know what that number was. Hundreds, maybe thousands and thousands of people. This was a huge group. Can you imagine everyone else bowing down and you alone and your two buddies with you there are standing for what is right? Would you take a stand as they did? These three decided they would rather die than disobey God. So far, we've seen the creation of this image, the dedication of the image, and the worship of the image, which brings us to our fourth and final point tonight, the defiance of the image. The defiance of the image. The courage of these three men should be an inspiration to us all. They defied this man-made statue. They stood for what was good and godly. But when the king heard this news, he was furious. He was absolutely outraged. He was angry that anyone would dare to disobey him. However, he decided, let's give these guys a second chance. Maybe they didn't hear. Maybe they didn't understand. So he immediately summoned these three men to his presence. Verse 13, Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up. Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? What an arrogant statement. Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? It's been said that the devil tempts us to destroy our faith, but God tests us to develop our faith. And we see that here. May I remind you of this? Those who compromise never win. Those who compromise never win. That was true for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's just as true for you and I today. When we compromise, we do not win. Which takes us back to the words of David in Psalm 34, verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. So how would God choose to deliver these three men? Would he choose to deliver them through life? Or would it be through the death of their physical bodies and they'd be delivered to the presence of God? and be with him forever after. To find out, though, you're going to have to come back next week. (laughs) Don't you hate it when people say that? I know I do. And then now you're wondering, Pastor Dave, why would you say that? Be Honestly, because it's fun. (laughs) (laughs) In all seriousness, though, there's so much that we can take away from this passage, uh, from this example. So many details. I didn't want to rush through it. There's a lot that we can take away. But if you are like me, And you are not a person who likes waiting. Uh, My mom always talked about patience, and I never really enjoyed that. But if you're a person who doesn't like waiting, then go home tonight. And I encourage you to read the last 15 verses of this chapter. It could be a great encouragement to you as you go through this next week. Next week, though, we'll finish this chapter. And then later on, we'll look at prophetic parallels between chapter 3 and future events. Um, I've seen that in a couple of commentaries. And some years ago, I think it was 11 or 12 years ago, Pastor did an entire message on that topic, prophetic parallels from Daniel 3. And it was fascinating. There's a lot we can learn from it. Before we wrap up the message, though, let me first ask you a very important question. In fact, it's the most important question that you could ever answer, and it is this. Where will you go when this life is over? Some of the reason that 
uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were able to be so courageous is because they didn't have to worry about what would happen after this life. They knew where they would spend eternity. So again, I ask you, where will you go when this life is over? Turn to one final chapter tonight, to 1 John chapter 5. God is quite clear in his word that you go to one of two places. Heaven or hell. Heaven or hell. There is no such thing as reincarnation. Um, you know, Laura and I were talking to a salesman here in St. Cloud some months ago, and we ended up having the opportunity to share the gospel with him. We asked him, you know, what do you believe? What's going to happen after this life? And he said something that I had not heard before. He believes we just get reincarnated as another person and keep living life over and over again. Um, I asked him where he found that, and he said he didn't know. He just thought of it himself. Um, now, thankfully, we have something much more reliable than that. We have the word of God, and God is quite clear. You go to one of two places. Those are the only options. Look with me at 1 John 5, verse 11. This is the record that God hath given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son, Jesus Christ. And then it tells us here, He that hath the Son hath life. If you have Jesus Christ, you have everlasting life. You will spend forever with God in heaven. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. You do not have everlasting life. Instead, as we know from other places in Scripture, you will spend forever in hell. God does not want that. That's why he loved us so much. He sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. The passage continues there in verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. We are sinners. We've all done wrong, and our sin separates us from God. God cannot allow any sin into heaven. One of the best ways we know to illustrate this is this uh, wallet illustration. Let this hand represent you and me in the entire world. Let this wallet represent our sin. Not only have we committed sin by choice, we're also born with the sin nature. There's nothing good we can do to save ourselves, just as Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We have sin upon us. A lot of people think that they can do good works to get them to heaven or to help get them to heaven. But God says, no, it's not of works. And that is where God stepped in for you and for me. Let this hand represent the Lord Jesus Christ. And I mean that very reverently. Jesus came to this earth. He lived a perfect, spotless life. He went to that cross. He died in our place. He paid for the sins of the whole world. He was that uh, propitiatory payment, that satisfactory payment for us, leaving us nothing left to pay. He died. He was buried. He rose again. When we place our faith in Jesus alone to save us, that payment is put to our account. God sees us in Christ without our sin. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves because Jesus paid the price in full. He gave his life, a perfect life for us. If you're here tonight and you've never trusted in Jesus alone to save you, don't wait. Believe on Jesus Christ. And you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you will go to heaven when this life is over. Not because I say it, but because God promises it. These things have been written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life. You don't have to wonder or doubt. You can know. Would you please bow with me as we wrap up the message in prayer? Father, we're so thankful for this day. We're thankful for everlasting life that you give us. You offer it as a free gift. We pray if there's anyone watching tonight who is not trusted in you alone for salvation, that they would do that, that they would not wait. We don't know how much time we have left on this earth. Be with us this week. We pray for those of us who are believers, who have already put our faith in you, that we would stand for what's right, not because we have to, but because we want to, and that we would be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Doesn't matter what anyone else is doing. Doesn't matter what our coworkers do, our family members, our, our fellow classmates, for those who are in school, that we would take a stand for what's right and that we would bring glory to you in all of it. Thank you for the many ways you provide and take care of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening. And would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. 
thank you so much and God bless you.